Hello? All right, so if we're ready, let's begin. Our next speaker is Rostislav Georgiev. Uh, he will be talking about uh, tooling that we can use in uh, Kubernetes, uh, cluster deployment, and also administration. So please welcome him. Thank you, folks. Uh, OK, so let's start. Uh, I, I will be introducing you to KubeADM, which is a tool that's not that very new, but uh, it's sort of gathering momentum, and it's uh, right before GA. So this tool is uh, a tool for uh, deployment, uh, upgrading, management, and tearing down of Kubernetes clusters. It's part of the main Kubernetes community, and it's developed as part of the Kubernetes source tree. But let's start at the beginning. It was the summer of uh, 2015, and July the 21st to be precise, and this was when Kubernetes 1.0 was uh, released. But there was kind of a problem with it, it was pretty difficult to get started. And why it was so difficult? Well, Kubernetes is actually a set of services. So we can see here uh, we have a master node, which is a separate machine, and a bunch of uh, worker nodes. And on the master node, we'll have an API server, which is a Kubernetes integral component controller manager, scheduler, and in this case, we also have etcd. And on the uh, Kubernetes nodes, we actually have kubelet, which is responsible for running the Kubernetes pods, uh, kubeproxy, in this case, we also have cadvisor, and some kind of uh, networking plugin. And of course, all of the different pods that uh, the user actually cares about. And as you can see from this whole picture, uh, there are many different uh, ways that things can go wrong. All of these are uh, different connections between services, not only on the same host as in this case, but between different hosts. And all of this has to be set up very carefully in order to avoid problems. So, of course, when Kubernetes 1.0 was released, there was only a one tool to do this, and it was sort of a testing tool. It was called kubeup sh, and it was basically a shell script, and this is the exact shell script from uh, Kubernetes 1.0. It basically uh, loads a bunch of uh, cloud-specific other scripts uh, that do d deployment that's based on the cloud infrastructure at hand, and basically uh, this is very opinionated, it was designed for testing, it couldn't do upgrades, and it was simply not suitable for uh, production use. Over the, the years, uh, different solutions came about, for example, Kubernetes Anywhere, uh, Kubespray, Cops, but, uh, and also many different uh, totally custom solutions. So, for example, as you can see here, I have done a simple search about Kubernetes provisioning in GitHub, and you can see some pretty staggering numbers here. And if I replace provisioning with deployment, I would get even larger numbers, but then I'll cross also with uh, solutions that uh, are not meant to deploy Kubernetes, but are meant to deploy applications on Kubernetes. So many people actually decide to have their own shell scripts, have their own um, custom scripting languages or even compiled languages like Go, and also deployment tools that you have all heard of or used in your day-to-day -day DevOps operations, such as the, uh, Ansible, Terraform, Puppet, Chef, and basically people started to go along their ways and reinvent the wheel. And all of these solutions actually became opinionated and they were heavily opinionated because of the use cases that people actually have. So some people will rather like to stick with uh, a particular CNI plugin and uh, 
basically make all their uh, deployments go around this or use a particular uh, container runtime or particular set of clouds that are like public clouds that are uh, that are used by their company who are they're working for and stuff like that so there wasn't any solution that was unique or like uh, configurable by all so everybody have to use some solution that is uh, opinionated and if they try to move into some different direction they either have to amend the solution or uh, go with a totally new one. So on the other hand there was also Docker Swarm and Docker Swarm actually allowed for very easy cluster installation so you can see here that uh, basically this is a Docker Swarm that I have initialized and it's like with Docker Swarm in it, and you have to do this on the like first machine of a Docker Swarm, and this will basically initialize the Swarm locally, and then print out a Docker Swarm join command. That's this long piece here, and this command will then be used for, on any machine that has uh, Docker installed in it to join it to a, a Swarm. So it was pretty easily, and also. Uh, you could automate it with Ansible Chef or whatever, uh, again, very easily. So in SIG Cluster Lifecycle, and SIG actually stands for SIG uh, Special Interest Group, this is uh, one of the interest groups that are part of the Kubernetes community. Uh, talk started upon, like, what do we do about this? Shall we, like, focus on a specific solution? Shall we start... Uh, uh, investing uh, workforce into uh, developing a solution that is close to like uh, uh, Docker Swarm or whatever other people are doing. And uh, a work group was formed and they decided to focus on the, the following uh, requirements for a new tool. First of all, this had to run on any uh, public cloud. So you can actually use this tool to, to provision Kubernetes clusters on public clouds, private clouds, or whatever, bare metal, whatever. Uh, then, of course, you have to not be restricted by the runtime. So you can actually use, like, these are a bunch of popular, at the moment, runtimes. I myself use a couple of those, and I know other people use all of these. Also different CNI plugins, so uh, basically you are allowed to uh, have whatever uh, networking uh, you like and not be restricted by a certain set of these. And of course, it should be upgradable. So uh, Kubernetes actually has a very short release cycle, so every three months we have a new minor release. And this minor release, uh, like we have three minor releases back in, in time that, uh, that, that are supported. So basically every year you have to do at least one upgrade of your cluster. And upgrading is very important because tearing down clusters is not, uh, not a good thing and not many clients actually want that, although many are happy with that. And of course it had to have the, the easy workflow of Docker Swarm. So, Development started in C cluster lifecycle, and uh, this resulted in the kubeadm tool, which the first version of which became available as part of Kubernetes 1.5. Now, let's start with this. Uh, what we need is we have to have some set of uh, Linux VMs. Now, uh, on top of these Linux VMs, you have to deploy uh, some CRI, that's either Docker, Containerd, Cryo, whatever. And after you deploy this, you have like uh, to install the, the Debian or RPM packages of uh, kubeadm, and these will bring with you like kubelet and kubectl, also as dependencies. And once you do that, we'll be able to start deploying via kubeadm. So Again, uh, with this picture, we have to, I'll show you how to deploy a, a 
one on one Kubernetes cluster. So this is one master and one worker node. So basically, we'll be deploying one of these and one of these. KubeADM will actually uh, deploy via single command. API server, controller manager, scheduler, and etcd. It will also deploy on the master kube proxy. And we'll expect that you have kubelet, which we already provided it with uh, the Debian or RPM packages. We'll also have to deploy on the master node. We'll have to deploy via kubectl uh, some network plugin. In this case, I'll be using Funnel. And then on the worker node, uh, we have deployed kubelet as part of the uh, package install via Dep or RPM, and all of the other stuff like kube proxy, its own instance of uh, the network plugin, and whatever, they are all deployed automatically. So we only need to join the, the node in there. Now let's start on the master node. Uh, the first thing we, which we actually do is kube ADM in it. In this case, I've been using this uh, option that's specific to my uh, network plugin. So I'm using Flannel, and this is actually described in the documentation. And we also need to have uh, sudo, because uh, kubeadm can only run as uh, root. And as, as you can see that we have a bunch of uh, log output here starting to flow down. And in the end, so there are a bunch of lines like this one. In the end, the command ends with this. Not sure if, if you can actually see this. But uh, we actually have a bunch of commands that are needed to uh, set up uh, kubectl. That's, that basically copy your kubeconfig into, uh, into your home folder. And we also have the kubeadm join command. It's this long command here. So moving on, we have, uh, we have done initial setup. And if, if we actually use kubectl get pods in all namespaces to see what we have in the cluster right now, we can actually see that we have only pods that are running under kube system. And those are like the standard uh, control plane pods that you can find in a, a Kubernetes cluster. And of course, we have also a couple of pods that are core DNS that are stuck at container creating. And they're stuck in there because uh, we don't have the network plugin installed. We do this uh, as a next step via kubectl apply. So in our case, we are applying a Flannel plugin, like a normal uh, Kubernetes setup, what we, what we will actually do with a manifest file. That's a YAML file. And as you can see here, you, you can actually spot that this is a daemon set. And it also sets up uh, a bunch of RBAC rows and uh, config maps. So if we, if we repeat the command, uh, you can actually see that uh, we have the core DNS uh, pods running right now. And we also have one additional uh, pod that is kubeflannel. And this is run on, like, it's responsible for the master node. Then let's move on and join the, uh, the actual uh, worker node. You can see that we actually copied here the, the exact kubeadm join command that uh, kubeadm init uh, printed us. Again, this is uh, run with sudo. And this is basically very straightforward flow. It does a little work, and it's basically uh, authenticating itself with the API server and configuring the kubelet to run pods locally. So if we return to the master node now and execute kubectl get nodes, you can actually see that we have a couple of nodes right now. Now, the master node actually bears the host name uh, Ubuntu, so this is a bit not a wise choice for a host name in my, on my part. And we have also the, the worker node here. Both of these run uh, Kubernetes version 1.12.1, .1, which at the time I did these slides was the latest version. And we have uh, like 
the master role attached to the master node and no, no roles attached to the worker node. So if we actually uh, run again kubectl get pods in all namespaces, but this time with minus O wide, we can see that we, we have a couple of new uh, pods. Uh, they're like uh, kube flannel, uh, one kube flannel instance that's actually run on worker one, and one kube proxy instance that's again run on worker one. So let's, let's talk about some of the key notable features of uh, kubeadm. So in this case, we are deploying a one-on-one -on -one cluster, which is one master and uh, one, uh, one worker node. Uh, basically, up until recently, we, can, we could have only one master cluster and many nodes, uh, but uh, uh, we actually added new functionality in order to uh, allow for high availability clusters that's a, that are multi-master clusters. Uh, there are a couple of setups that are available to a user. One of these is the uh, stacked etcd variant. So the, the stacked etcd means that uh, you, kubeadm actually deploys an etcd instance on a master node uh, for you. And if you don't wish to do that, you can, go so, you can also go with the external etcd, which is like an etcd cluster provisioned by someone else. Now, both of these methods actually require uh, one to set up uh, uh, his or her own uh, load balancer on, uh, in front of the API server. Now, these are actually, this is kind of cumbersome, but uh, depending on the public cloud or uh, whether you're using uh, some local solutions such as bare metal, we can use Nginx or whatever to, to do load balancing in front of the API servers. And of course, this is actually the link to the documentation of all of this, and you can actually access it through the QR code in here. Next, it's, of course, upgrades. Now, upgrade is, uh, as, as I told you, a very important feature of uh, kubeadm. And uh, basically, how upgrades work is uh, you, at some point, have to do a kubeadm upgrade, and this will actually do a bunch of checks. It will upgrade the control plane by pivoting new, uh, new pods for the control plane that are versioned with the new version, and uh, like remove the old pods. And then it will also apply the new manifests for uh, DNS, kube proxy, and Finally, it will regenerate the uh, certificates for your cluster. Now, uh, one of the, the, the key things that uh, you need to remember in here is that kubeadm can actually upgrade only from the previous minor version. So if you want to do an upgrade from 1.10 to 1.12, you actually first have to upgrade to 1.11 and then to 1.12. Now, in this way, we actually allow uh, for a smoother experience and uh, better tested experience for uh, users to, to have. So uh, we obviously will be like, it's not going to work very well for us if we uh, try to like uh, upgrade from any of the previous three or four versions of Kubernetes. And of course, this is the documentation. Follow it uh, very closely if you're upgrading a cluster. So for every, uh, almost in every uh, different uh, Kubernetes version, there are like minor tweaks to the upgrade guide. And these are usually uh, done because of we merged something or something changed somewhere. And if you skip those, uh, you may actually end up at the end with a non-working cluster. And this will actually be like harmful for you. So again, here is the QR code. You can actually find this link in there. And finally, bootstrap tokens. Bootstrap tokens are a very interesting feature. So they were actually first invented for uh, kubeadm, but are now uh, first class citizens in uh, a Kubernetes setup. So these are a special kind of secret that are actually uh, 
verified by the API server. Now, they, they actually uh, have two parts divided by a dot. The first part is uh, the public part. The public part is uh, six digits or uh, uh, small caps letters. And this is actually the name of the uh, bootstrap token. And the secret part is the next part. This is actually 16 uh, num uh, numbers or small caps letters. And this is actually the part that you actually have to guard very closely. Uh, these bootstrap tokens actually have time to live. And by default, uh, Cubadium generates 24-hour uh, bootstrap tokens. So if we actually go back to the Cubadium join command, yeah, here, you can see that we actually supply such a token, is this one. And this is actually done in order to authenticate the uh, joining node to the uh, initial master node. And uh, we need this uh, because it will be much more easier this way. Be the, other, the other way is basically to copy a bunch of certificates uh, to your kubelet. Now, bootstrap tokens you can actually use for even for your own applications if they're Kubernetes aware. And uh, another more thing to mention is that uh, if you actually, uh, like Kubeadm generates 24-hour tokens, if you skip the 24-hour window, you cannot join with the same join command another node in the cluster, and you, you basically have to invoke Kubeadm again on a master node and uh, tell it to generate a new token for the next 24 hours, or if you override that, you'll basically, you can extend this like for a month or two, or whatever. Now, steps and challenges to GA. Actually, this is uh, news from, the, from Wednesday. Uh, in the next release of Kubernetes 1.13, uh, Kubernetes will be GA. Uh, the steps to, to do this is uh, we first have to uh, move uh, the configuration file format to, to beta. Uh, it was, uh, until now it was in alpha state and it was basically a bunch of uh, random flags in a flat YAML space and this was uh, not very good for configuration. So basically moving it to beta we, we strive to remove redundant parts, uh, stuff that nobody uses, and uh, what we are left with uh, is configured in a way that gives it more texture, so it's more like uh, uh, the format is like a tree right now, and it's much more easier to use and configure. Uh, then we also need to improve user experience, so CLI is a bit uh, like an oddball, and uh, many of its aspects are really good. So we have the, the Docker Swarm init and join workflow and the upgrade command, but uh, some of the stuff is like uh, still not doing very well. And we need to, to like to address different issues in there. And also some of the errors and warning messages that we actually provide users are uh, really bad and they are not descriptive of problems and we also need to, to address those. And of course, uh, the Kubernetes community actually uh, throw the SIG cluster lifecycle folks under the bus by uh, assigning to them also the release process. So we actually need to provide uh, release packages and images for uh, different Kubernetes components. and. Uh, this is kind of awkward still for us, and we are trying to get used to, to this. And as I see, uh, there are some uh, SUSE folks here in the, the audience, uh, and also they have booth. So actually, SUSE is doing a like, uh, great job in the past few months interacting with our community to, uh, to bring on RPMs and uh, to move forward with the release process. And we also need feedback. Now, 
Of course, many of us who are actually developing KubeADM do our own steps. And uh, this is like a recipe to turn KubeADM into an opinionated solution. And many of the folks actually don't like uh, the way KubeADM is doing things. But uh, basically, nobody is contacting the, the people who are developing KubeADM, uh, what their problems are, what their vision for, uh, for setting up a Kubernetes cluster is. And uh, basically, uh, we are kind of left in the dark. So please come to us, check what KubeADM is doing. Why is it working for you, or why is it not working for you? Uh, what's missing, can we do something uh, better, and uh, whatever. Give us your impressions. And, of course, developers are needed. Uh, right now, most of the original contributors to KubeADM have moved on to new stuff, and uh, we are a bit down on the development force. So, uh, if you wish to, to become part of this community, you can join. Here is like uh, our uh, office hours meeting. It's usually, it's on Zoom, and it's usually uh, 7 p.m. Bulgarian time on, when, on Wednesdays, uh, 5 p.m. at uh, UK time, and I am uh, US Pacific time. Uh, here is a link to the meeting notes and agenda. You can also find the Zoom link in there, and this is again the, the QR code of this. And you can also find us on Slack, on the given Slack channels, and we have uh, the Cyclos or Lifecycle uh, Google group. Okay. Uh, of course, this is our bug tracker. Uh, it's, it's kind of weird right now, because uh, there was a notion of moving uh, KubeADM uh, source code out of the main Kubernetes repository, so you can find that uh, the kubeadm source code under kubernetes slash kubernetes, but uh, the issue tracker is in kubernetes slash kubeadm, and uh, this is kind of still a bit more awkward, but uh, we have to live with it. And if you wish to, to try to fix an issue, or uh, like you give some issue a try, again, this is uh, the uh, link to the bug tracker, here's the QR code, and the issues actually have labels, so you can, you can see them in here. Uh, good first issue and help wanted issues are uh, issues that are really good for uh, starters. We label those for people who want to get engaged with the community. And also, uh, priority backlog is another way to start engaging with the community. Now, priority backlog issues are actually a bit uh, like uh, more hard to tackle on for a novice, but uh, if you are like experienced with Kubernetes, you can give one of these to try. Now, let's, let's see what Minikube is. Now, how many of you have actually used Minikube? Well, it's a bit of a the, the awkward cousin in the uh, Kubernetes deployment uh, sphere. So, uh, not sure if you actually... Have you actually had any problems with uh, Minikube? How many of you? Yeah. So, basically, the way Minikube works is it sets up a small Linux VM that actually has pre-provisioned uh, Kubernetes control plane, and it's meant to uh, run your pods and the Kubernetes control plane on the same VM. And the pros of this is like it's very easy to set up. It's basically a shell script that uh, brings this into your setup. And the cons is, of course, it's opinionated. You don't have uh, any control on the networking. Uh, there are also some strange bugs that I have experienced, especially with uh, different uh, shell versions and stuff like that. And uh, the setup that Minikube actually uses for Kubernetes is not very close for uh, production use. And uh, basically, uh, what you want is to test your application while you're developing it uh, by supplying it to stuff that's more close to what you're going to run this in production. So, 
let's see if we can actually use uh, Cube ADM to, as a replacement of uh, Minikube. Okay, so let me just duplicate my screen. Can you see this? Yep. So what I've actually done already here is I prepared the Ubuntu server VM. And this is basically a stock Ubuntu server, 18.4. I've installed Docker on it. And because I don't really trust uh, many of the uh, like conference Wi-Fi's and stuff like that, I've pulled uh, a few images to it. So right now I am going to SSH into the uh, into this virtual machine. Okay, and you can actually see that uh, right now there is nothing running on this machine, and I have pre-pulled a bunch of images for the demo, and also I have actually uh, installed kubeadm, kubectl, and the, the rest of the bunch, again, simply to save time from, uh, from downloading. Now, let's start. First, uh, we need to disable swap. So kubelet does not like uh, uh, your machine with swap. And in this case, we are going to do swap off minus minus a and we are also going to disable it permanently from fs top and now we are going to uh, get ourselves a default configuration for init. Now let's remove what we don't need. We actually need uh, init configuration. As you can see in here, we have this. We need cluster configuration. And the rest of the things we actually don't need at all, so we delete them. Now from these configurations, let's start at the top. We don't want this portion. We don't want to deal with bootstrap tokens. And now let's move on to node registration. Now you can see here, this is like a, this is a taint. So every master node is actually tainted by kubeadm. So only uh, control plane uh, pods can actually run on it. So in our case, we want to actually allow for uh, user pods to, to run on the master node. So we want to delete the taint. But we, if we actually delete the entire taint key, uh, this is going to be defaulted back to the same taint. So we need to just supply this with an empty array. Now moving on to cluster configuration. We obviously need the API version. Remove much of this. Now the Kubernetes version we want to deploy is 1.12.2. We don't need the cluster local. We don't need this. And we actually need to supply a pod subnet. So the pod subnet is actually uh, specific to the network plugin we are using too, and we are going to use Flannel. So Flannel is actually a bit hardwired, and 
Let me just copy that from the official documentation. Not sure if you can actually see anything of this. And here somewhere should, yeah. Here we have a flannel tab and just copy this one. And here we are actually going to use the unified control plane image just to save time on uh, like downloading or basically this is a single image that's uh, used for both, for all the uh, Kubernetes control plane components, including Kupropsky. Uh, now this is this one. Hypercube version one twelve. And that should be it. And now, let's clear. Now we actually need to run kubeadm in it with this configuration. OK. So this is actually going to take a little time. Uh, normally, it will take a, a bit more time because it will be also downloading images. But because I pre-pulled the images, uh, it will actually be much faster. But uh, of course, uh, it does some pretty complex jobs here. So it will bring up uh, configuration for kubelet, uh, spin up uh, control plane pods, and stuff like that. And this actually takes some time. Now we are actually almost at the final step. OK, so this is actually done. So you can see the familiar output here. We have the uh, three commands that uh, we can actually use to uh, set up kubectl locally on the machine. And we also have the kubeadm join command, which we're actually not uh, interested at the moment. So let's, let's simply copy these three in order to get kubectl running in here. Oops. And we are actually now ready to exit this machine and return back to our main uh, host. So what we are going to do now is we will copy the uh, cube config file from the target machine. Cube dev. And we are going to copy it on our local machine. OK, so we are actually able right now to do kubectl get pods in all namespaces. So the situation is kind of familiar here. Uh, we have all of the uh, control plane pods running, and we have the core DNS ones stuck. So we'll simply apply via kubectl. Let's clear this up. Apply cube flannel. So this installs cube flannel. And if we, if we actually do this again, we can actually see that we have a cube flannel pod that's currently initializing. And once this initializes, yeah. 
if we run this again. Yes, right now we actually have all of the pods running. So this is actually right now ready to use. And so let's try to deploy something on it. So I have like, I'll show you how to deploy OpenFast, which is a serverless solution. And the way we do this is again with kubectl. We need to apply a couple of different YAML files. And if we run again, kubectl get pods in all namespaces, we can see that that we actually have, apart from the cube system ones, we actually have pods running on, you know, under the OpenFast uh, namespace. So let's see if everything, yeah, everything is running. And what we are going to do right now is open up our browser, going to the cube dev machine on this special port on which you have actually a node port service deployed by OpenFast, and we are able to go into the GUI. And we can actually do whatever we want here. OK, so I think I've got only a minute or so. So thank you very much. I'm not sure if we can like handle a single question, or you can actually find me uh, around the whole room. So thank you very much. All right, so we have a time just for one question. Very quick, somebody. One question time. All right, then thank you very much once again.